All right. I think we're going to start. And um, I want to, you know, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm David Gersten, Director of Our Social Numbers. And uh, this is the second uh, of our three part uh, series uh, conversation with uh, uh, Michael Benson, Chris Rose, and Andreas Mershon. And uh, I just want to say last night was fantastic. Um, and I want to thank the three of you. It was an incredible, remarkable uh, exchange. Um, and and I, I want to thank you for, for bringing these conversations to our, to our Sunship exhibition in the, in the Venice Bienal. Now, now tonight, uh, tonight's conversation is titled uh, Futuring uh, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, this conversation will be sort of led by Michael Benson and Chris Rose and of course Andreas joining in as we, we hope he will. Um, I was thinking all day about last night's uh, conversation and uh, working on it, you know? And, uh, and so I decided I wanna open tonight with just sharing a short fragment um, that I think echoes some of last night. Um, partially, uh, this is coming from thinking about uh, Michael's point that uh, he made at, at some point about um, the opening scene in 2001 with the, with the, well, with the, with the bone that, that could be used as a tool or a weapon. And of course, when he added uh, Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke's uh, observation that you know it's not that uh, we have evolved and then made technology, but that technology and human life um, have co-evolved, or you could say co-constructed each other. Sometimes I, I think when you know as we build the world, the world builds us, uh, and I and I mean that quite literally, and I think that's a lot of what you were all uh, bringing up last night. So with those things in mind, I, I, I remembered today an exchange that I've shared many times, but I'm gonna share it again tonight um, uh, with another dear friend named Remo Guidieri. Uh, he's an anthropologist and uh, he taught at Cooper for the School of Architecture at Cooper Union for, for 30 years. Um, and, and one of those times he did a series of talks called Subterranean. Um, and he was talking about the cave drawings 40,000, 50,000 years ago. Um, and it was a whole like a 12 part lecture series on the cave drawing. Uh, and at, at some point he started wrestling with this simple, difficult question, which is why? Why did we go down into the caves to draw? And he was saying, well, you know, it's uh, running from the animals, you know, it's not enough. He dispensed with all of the sort of uh, normative responses to that. And he started talking about the darkened spaces in the caves and the darkened spaces of consciousness and in the imagination. And he started talking about an equalization of pressures atmospherically between the darkened spaces of the caves and the darkened spaces of consciousness. And he's, he started talking about a, this equalization of pressures and that in that drawing popped out, right? <laughs> Meaning drawing crossed over, right? Now this had to do with the idea that there are marks, you make a mark, there are marks, they are marks, but they're also something else. Meaning they're more than themselves, representation, right? Meaning it's, it's carbon, it's just stuff. Boom, there's the stuff. But we also recognize the mark as something other than itself. Yes. So I, as I mentioned last night, a drawing can be of something, but it always is something, right? So he was wrestling with this. And at some point uh, he stopped and he said, you know, often the story is that we transitioned from homo fibar to homo sapiens, and then we started to draw. He said, there's another possibility. Perhaps we found drawing down in the caves and that's what caused us to become homo sapiens, right? Perhaps the transition itself is what set in motion by drawing. It was set in motion by drawing, right? Which is the point that Michael was saying last night that it's not one direction. Okay? And now, at, 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 very briefly, at an another moment, I was sharing that with a philosopher friend named Tom Zimmer. And I was telling him about Ramos caves and the drawing and evolution. Uh, and Tom asked a simple, difficult question. <laughs> he, he said, why is it that those marks 
appear to us as a bear. He said, what if those marks were not made by our ancestors, but by bears? <laughs> now, the, the enigma in that, the humor in that, um, is because it expresses some deep linkages between drawing, between representation, language, substance, and the nature of human nature. Right? Because as archaic as those drawings may be, we sense, we smell, that those marks were made by something that we actually think of as related to us, we think of as human. Right? And for me today, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking that these, those moments are, uh, and, and the questions of transformation, they're linked to future. They're linked to the bone that is a tool, that is a weapon. And I also wanted to say, I think, I believe the caves, are linked to the haunting room at the end of 2001, A Space Opera. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I, I, and, and that's really, I, I, today when I realized, I, I was thinking, because at some point last night, the question of what are we becoming? And I realized, you know, we are in the caves of now. And I feel like that room at the end of Space Odyssey that I know you know an incredible amount about, Michael, and have a lot to say about could be linked to those. So I, I just wanted to share that with all of you and now I'll hand it off to, to, to you guys to start the conversation. Thank you, David, for such a typically brilliant intro. I really, I thought provoking and that can, could lead to so many great places. I mean, um, you know, one thing that occurs to me, occurred to me many times when I looked at those uh, reproductions of those uh, cave paintings and then also, um, Werner Herzog's incredible three-dimensional film where you got to see them textured on the wall is that we look at those things and we think, oh, that's the beginning, right? But, but that was the ultimate in modernity. They didn't have the word or they, I, I believe they didn't. It was the ultimate in cutting edge. We have arrived at the ability to do this after millions of years of evolution. So imagine it from their perspective when they were doing that. That was like the incredible thing we can do now, you know. That's exactly yeah. it. You know, so so our past is always uh, somebody else's present, and you know, and 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 an expression of the future. Um, well, and we are the cavemen. I mean, we are the archaics. Yeah. For for an unknown future. Well, two thousand and one makes the point, and Arthur C. Clarke on who on whose ideas and Nietzsche. Um, on whose ideas 2001 is based, made the point that, you know, we are ch children and that, you know, he wrote an, a novel, Childhood's End. We are an intermediate phase of evolution. We're always, actually, any creature is at an intermediate <laughs> phase of evolution, by the way. <laughs> right. So um, um, part of the point of 2001 is you know, that whole sequence at the end in the room is this evolution, rapid fire, uh, mm. you know, um, transformation into a new species that's you know um, that's part of the part of what's going on in that room but you know um what i should probably do now is share the screen because i, I we have been working chris Michael, and I before, working. before you do this i have a question about the cave drawings do you think when you said they're the pinnacle of their achievement do you think they were used uh, in the same way that we use galleries now or museums that people would like to and look at them have conversations what, or was it a you know an artist and puts it put, put it there and for for posterity did they know you think that it was going to be seen later what was what was their, their functional you know at their present when they were being made what how, how did it go about i think i mean we don't know but i think there's proto cinema there because um and you see that in Werner herzog's film which is of course a film um but you see the way fire the only way they could see those cave walls is with burning torches and there was a organic flickering and you know there was a sense of motion on those walls so now i don't know to what extent there might have been ritual involved and you know involving the hunt or or even you know um, commemorating the spirits of the animals they survive on killed you know which we've seen in north american uh native american tradition and so forth um but i think there's proto cinema in there i really do uh, I jumped back in because. Oh, go ahead, Chris. They were also undivided from the uh, animals themselves as spirits, and 
the quality of the drawing on some of those drawings is the best that's ever been done. Mm. So how do you get from nothing to the best that's ever been done several thousand or millions of years ago? And, uh, you know, it's a different kind of story if you look at it that way. There wasn't anything before those paintings as far as we know. Except there's, there had to have been. It's just that it's not yeah. discovered yet, you know? Yeah, I know. I mean, we one found, we have little freeze frames of a long story. One of the shocking things that I learned about the cave drawings is that there are certain parts of the drawings that, that they can, you know, verify scientifically that they were worked on over a 5,000 year period. Incredible. I mean. Now, so think about, the different relationship to time, to biology, to understanding yep. of, of transformation, that it, you know, the same part of a wall was drawn and evolved and changed over 5,000 years. I mean, that's, you know, about, you know, it's before the pyramids. I mean, if we were to bring it up to now uh, and that, so how, how do you have like, a culture that understands, you know, cultural production in a 5,000 year time frame is kind of incredible. It makes well, building, even, it, but it's still being worked on. It makes building a cathedral be like, you know, even though it's three centuries like that, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but some of these caves are still being worked on. Uh, here in Greece, so there's some, they, they say it's 15,000 years old, but then there's also graffiti from 1821 and graffiti from recently. People go in there and they scratch it and they do all sorts of horrible mm -hmm. things to it because there's no guards or anything. Uh, mm -hmm. but the only guard that they have is that the fact that it's not marked and unless to there really hard to find although now that island burned down so now it's going to be actually quite easy to find so oops i didn't think of that before so yeah i know where it is but now everybody will know where it is hmm. well so on that note <laughs> yes I'm going, to, I'm going to start this powerpoint and i will share the screen i don't know if i should in what order i should do that um probably i should start the powerpoint first Yeah, okay. Hang on a sec. Aha. Uh -huh. So probably you're seeing the wrong screen. Let me stop this. Share screen. That's the one. Okay. Do you see a screen with text at the top and a picture in the middle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, you know, I wanted to start and, you know, obviously Chris hop in at any moment to correct mm -hmm. my many errors, but um, the initial part of our discussion is um, material I threw together. Um, and uh, I came up with this um, kind of a th thesis statement here when I was, um, I was steeping myself once again in this extraordinary book by Gaston Bachelard, um, The Poetics of Space, because I was thinking this is an architecture you know, biennial. Um, and I, I stumbled on, I was reading the, the foreword by John Stilgo and came up with a kind of, he, he produced a kind of initial thesis statement for, for the, at least the first part of the discussion. Um, in the Poetics of Space, Bachelard uh, reveals time after time that setting is more than seen in works of art. Uh, that it is often the armature around which the work revolves. He elevates setting to the, its rightful place alongside character and plot and offers readers a new angle of vision that reshapes any understanding of great paintings and novels and folk tales too. Now it's interesting that John Stilgo doesn't mention theater and film, but um, nowhere is this more true than in Kubrick's 1968 film, 2001 A Space Odyssey with its extraordinary emphasis on visual expression and its extraordinary sets and interior spaces. Um, and I would say you could easily argue that the armature around which that film's epic storyline revolves is the mysterious Louis XIV bedroom at the end of the film, the site of the transformation and rebirth of the central character of the last section of the film, David Bowman, who is kind of named um, after Odysseus and is the Odysseus uh, character. Um, 
But so I thought, you know, for those who are watching who haven't seen the film in a long time and some may have never seen the film, I want to do a brief visual recap of the story. It will be brief. And then uh, you know, for me, the best part of, of uh, anything uh, with Chris Rose and Andreas is the ability is just chatting with them and, you know, shooting ideas back and forth. So I'll try to make this fast. But here's a recap of the 2001 story. I'll just quickly say that um, the, the rectangular form is something that I want you to remember, um, keep in your mind as we go through these series of images, because yeah. um, that's, we will come to that in various ways, so you understand what it is. Exactly. So 2001 starts four million years ago, you see a title on the screen, uh, The Dawn of Man. Um, the film spans the evolution of humanity from pre-human to human and then post-human. Um, and, and it starts with a starving band of man apes in Africa. Um, you can see that they're skinny, they're not in good health. And one, one night, this mysterious object, this rectangular object appears among them uh, and, um, um, and has some impact on them. And one impact it has is that one of the man apes, um, uh, again, starving uh, uh, creatures, um, has this epiphany while scrabbling around in the dust uh, with amongst, you know, in, in, amongst skeletal remains and intuits that a heavy thigh bone might have some use other than you know, just lying there um, and figures out uh, in this extraordinary scene that it can be used as a tool. In fact, it can be used as a weapon. And here I want to quote a great, a great thing I read just the other day by David Mikic, who, who wrote a biography of Stanley Kubrick, uh, came out last year. Um, and he wrote about the, that monolith being, quote, the tablet of our first law, thou shalt kill. <laughs> extraordinary comment. Okay, and then uh, in, in a euphoric, uh, th you know, throwing of the bone, the, the, the uh, moon watcher is the name of the man ape, and he, and in a kind of frenzy, uh, ecstasy, he throws the bone into the sky, and there's this epic match cut with an orbiting spacecraft, and we vault four million years into the future, uh, to the year two thousand and one. Now twenty years in our past, um, in interestingly enough, and um, and we discover mostly non-verbally, that um, a, a monolith has been discovered on the surface of the moon and excavated, and so, some astronauts go to check it out. Uh, there they are on the lunar surface. Um, one of them touches it uh, very much the way the man apes do uh, earlier in the film, just you know, 10, 15 minutes earlier. Um, it sends a pulse of, of, of uh, radio energy in the direction of Jupiter, um, the human race sends a spacecraft uh, discovery in the direction of Jupiter. Uh, in the bottom image, it's a relatively rare, quite rare uh, it, uh, shot of the model uh, at the MGM studios north of London. The spacecraft has uh, a bunch of astronauts in hibernation and two of them awake who are kind of caretakers of the, uh, of the spacecraft. And it also has this individual uh, the first, and I would argue still the most um, powerful and convincing representation of artificial intelligence in, in film history, PAL 9000, um, who watches everything through this cyclopean red eye. Um, he then gets into a kind of duel with the, you know, he kills one astronaut and, and, and the survivor he, he has a duel with the survivor who makes his way into the brain room of Hal. Uh, you can see Hal's eye on the right. And Dave Bowman, played by Keir DeLay, is methodically uh, uh, deprogramming Hal's mind while Hal talks to him. Now, when I was six years old, my mom took me to see this film in 1968. And that particular scene got me uh, the most, I would say. I mean, the horror and the just the power of that scene where Hal's saying, stop, Dave, I can feel it, my mind is going. Anyway, our human hero vanquishes a cyclops, basically, um, if we're gonna look at the Odysseus as a model, I mean, uh, the Odysseus, the Odyssey as a model, um, 
Bowman is the sole survivor, arrives at Jupiter. Again, some alien intelligence seems to have placed these monoliths, um, both on the moon and on the earth. We know that the humans of uh, 2001 don't know about the first one. Bowman goes on this extraordinary trip through time and space. Um, uh, the visual effects of that sequence hold up today, which just is a testament to the craft and precision of Stanley Kubrick and his team, including Doug Trumbull, who I've, I've gotten to know and, I, and, and like very much uh, in the last 10 years. Um, Bowman's mind is being blown as he goes on this trip. This is very much a film of the late 60s. I mean, it is, it's a trip with multiple, you know, uh, I suppose, multiple definitions of that term. Um, and then he ends up in that room, um, which serves as a kind of um, shield from the power of the universe and the intensity of the experience of vaulting through space and time. Um, the presumption is, but it's all inferred, this, this film is a masterpiece of ambiguity um, and there are a million interpretations possible, but the assumption is, uh, or one assumption, one valid assumption is that the aliens who are manipulating our species um, have decided to place him in an environment that shields him from the shock. Um, either it's taken from his subconscious or it's taken from TV broadcasts from Earth, we don't know. Um, and then there's this extraordinary uh, series of shots. Now these, what we're seeing here, that's a Polaroid, production Polaroid. Uh, I researched a book on 2001 came out in 2018 on the 50th anniversary. And I got to, you know, I was paid to research a film that I love, which was a privilege. Um, and I found, I got produced scans or found scans of some of the Polaroids taken on set. So you're looking at Polaroids taken on set in that room. There's the director looking through the lens and looking at Kier Delay in his suit. Um, and you know, those who have seen the film will remember um, Keir DeLay, the astronaut, I mean, David Bowman, played by Keir DeLay, um, goes through several stages of, of rapid evolution in that room. He sees himself uh, having his last supper as an older man. And then the version of himself having the last supper suddenly no realizes there's somebody else in the room and it's himself as a very old man on his deathbed, more production stills. Um, and then the monolith appears in the room and our character um, points towards it and is transformed into a fetus, which arrives back at earth. And that's the end of the movie. Um, so how did this structure come about and, um, and what does it all mean? Well, I'm not going to try to explain what it all means. We're actually, I think Chris and I will probably be talking a bit now about um, the room yeah. and, and so forth. But um, I did want to say that 2001 was very much jointly authored by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke um, and based, as I said earlier, uh, on, on some of Clarke's ideas about the rebirth of the species, but also Nietzsche, you know, the idea that we are the, the subhumans, you know, and the Superman is coming. That we are on this tightrope between the apes and, and the supermen, we call them. Yeah, um, one, in, one interpretation of um, the, the reason for the room being there was it doesn't incidentally have a door. It's a, right. it's a room that is closed, so there's no entry or exit. Um, is that uh, it's when the radiation was transmitted from the obelisk um, into space, that uh, it sampled everything that was around, that was familiar to people, that was their frame of reference, that their mind was based on. And it then, it sampled that and it reconstructed everything at this place of rest, where the transformation was going to be instigated. For right. example, when the book, in the book, as I believe, um, the astronaut goes into the kitchen to get food and packages and so on are familiar. But when he opens them, there's a strange blue stuff in, in all of it. Everything's the same. 
and uh, it's as though the sampling uh, gave out at that point and there's something about the other culture or the other mentality represented by what's in the food parcels but everything else is accurate um, right. and I would say notice that the room itself is uh, a square shape and it's composed of x y z axis and that's the point I will come to later excellent excellent well um, yeah, exactly. Um, that, it's interesting how the novel, uh, which was written concurrently uh, with the film, um, it does diverge in, in, in key ways. Um, and, and in fact, it was finished before a lot of decisions were made by Kubrick during the production. But yeah. I just wanted to point out that um, apart from being jointly authored uh, by, by Kubrick and Clark, Early in their collaboration in late 1964, Kubrick handed Clark a book to read. It was Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, um, an amazing panoramic look at the commonalities between human mythologies. And Kubrick quoted one of Campbell's core observation about the journey common to all mythological heroes. Uh, and the quote is, a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder, fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. And Campbell referenced in the book, among other examples, Prometheus ascending to heaven, stealing fire from the gods and descending and Jason sailing through quote, the clashing rocks into a sea of marbles, circumventing the dragon, guarding the golden fleece and returning with the fleece and the power to wrest his rightful throne from a usurper. And of course, the Odyssey itself has this structure. Um, mm -hmm. So although 2001 is opaque on many levels, intentionally so, um, you do have that core um, mythological um, narrative, dramaturgical the relevance to Prometheus was um, just simply in one sense that uh, by stealing light from the gods and giving it to the humans, he was um, preventing the vicarious behavior of the gods and uh, which implies that he's giving a rationality and the power to develop on their own to the humans. Fantastic, yes. Yeah. Can I, uh, can I just jump in to, to tell you a couple of things that I find super interesting? Um, I resonate with this movie way before I met Michael and to, to be here and listening to this is just, I don't know, the universe is speaking to me. <laughs> um, I grew up in Greece and in the early 80s, I was uh, schooled in science fiction by my uncle who is, a, uh, is an artist and he managed to instill a, a deep love of 2001 uh, the book and then my grandfather owned a vcr which was very rare in those days in greece on had the only tape that he owned was 2001 so of course <laughs> i watched it i don't know how many times but i'd never seen it on a big screen until the re uh, issue in 2018 and it was like a religious experience i went and saw it on the giant 70 millimeter thing in arlington massachusetts and finally the little screen on a kind of a scratch little tape which i've rewound many times and i saw that um, and I wanted to ask some things uh, of Michael now. You know, when he throws up the, um, the bone and it comes down a spacecraft, I, I heard that this is one of the most famous cuts, if not the most famous cut in all of cinema. Yeah, that it is. probably is. You know, let's get to that in one second. I just want to, I'm almost done with this, um, but I do want to talk about that. Uh, you know, I'm, almost, I'm really almost done and then we'll, we'll talk about some of that. By the way, seeing it on a, on a VCR on a tiny screen is such a <laughs> horror. I can imagine Cooper. I know, but, <laughs> but hundreds of times know. probably. It's the only tape, it was the only tape in the household. <laughs> okay, but I'm glad you saw it. At least you were intrigued enough to see it on the big screen. So as thousands to, and thousands of times. <laughs> as to the room specifically, I want to give credit to an unsung hero, 2001 production designer, Tony Masters. He's, he's seen here on the left. Uh, along with Fred Ordway and Harry Lange, the other two guys there, uh, Ordway in the middle, Lange on the right, uh, both of whom worked with Werner von Braun at Huntsville. There were a lot of connections between actual rocketry and actual space flight uh, and, uh, and, and, and the film. Um, and Masters, I found a great quote from Tony Masters uh, about their, his work with these guys and other people on the film uh, that really resonated, resonated, I put it in my book. 
the quote, the strange thing was that we all worked together for so long that we began to design in the, design in the same way. We began to design in the same way. Just like Georgian or Victorian is a period, we designed 2001 as a period. We designed mm -hmm. a way to live right down to the last knife before. If we had to design a door, we would do it in our style. So, you know, um, this room at the end of time and space was very much master's um, creation. Um, Kubrick and Clark had the idea of a space, a shelter for the hero after this space-time journey. Um, but how it would actually look, look was, was not determined. And they, as, as usual with Kubrick, they tried everything. It's kind of like that observation the Brits had, the Churchill had of, had of the Americans that they can always be counted on to do the right thing after exhausting all other options. <laughs> <laughs> Kubrick had a little bit of that. He tried everything. But anyway, um, so the director and Tony Masters discussed a number of ideas of how to visualize that space. And one proposal was for an interior even more futuristic than the spacecraft that you saw in the film. But that was rejected on the grounds that audiences might think they were seeing where the movie's unseen aliens uh, lived mm -hmm. rather than a space that had been created for Bowman's, uh, you know, in order to protect him and possibly from his own subconscious in order to provide him with this safe space. Yeah. Nice. Um, so after a lot of debate, Masters just said to Kubrick suddenly, why not have a French bedroom? I mean, if you're going to have a bedroom, it, would, it could be anything. But one thing we can do quite well here at Borumwood is a French bedroom. We'll do it in a nice, soft, gray, green <laughs> color scheme. And Kubrick said, yeah, let's do that. Um, just to pay tribute and to uh, give credit where credit is due. I mean, film is a collaborative process. And as I described in my book, um, by now he really trusted, Kubrick trusted Masters implicitly. Um, in part, that was beca because many months before, Masters had finally, and, and very similarly to the story I just said, put an end to many months of complicated design evolution uh, for the cryptic object um, at the center of that picture and at the center of the narrative of 2001, which morphed from being shaped like a tetrahedron or a pyramid to they actually built a extremely expensive giant lucite monolith, which Kubrick saw. I mean, it cost as much as a mid-sized house in London at the time. We're talking probably a quarter of a million dollars they spent on this, <laughs> on a lucite monolith of about the same shape as that because lucite worked better cooling that way. Uh, they were told that it would be better to make it look like a pack of cigarettes or be of approximately those dimensions. And then, so they had to live with that. But then Kubrick saw it and it looked green and it looked like glass. It didn't look like a crystal mm. kind of um, immaculate crystal object. And so he said, just shelve it. And everybody was shocked because it had cost so much. But then finally masters who had a reputation for thinking fast on his feet, feet said, okay, Let's just make a black one because then nobody will know what that is. And Kubrick said, okay, let's do that. <laughs> and as a result, that's the genealogy of the, of the monolith. Um, I just wanna say as a point of personal privilege, I got to, uh, I got to be in that room myself uh, in, in, in uh, 2018 mm -hmm. um, because uh, British-born artist Simon Birch did this one-to-one -one reconstruction of that room, and it was at the National Air and Space Museum in 2018 to mark the 50th anniversary of the film's release. Uh, and so I got to actually experience it myself, and that was a rather an extraordinary experience. By the way, Barmicide, it's a Barmicide feast. Barmicide means illusory or imaginary and therefore disappointing, but there was nothing disappointing about walking into uh, Birch's recreation of that room. Michael, uh, can I just can you go back to the, um, the image and the monolith a second? I yeah. just want to say why we're doing this. Um, that uh, the room, if you think about the room, it uh, uses a decorative language. It's a, it has pattern, it has symmetry, it mm. has lines of shadow, it has um, edge, you know, the dissolved edges of complicated design. And it has many features, all of which became very familiar at a certain time. 
people over a hundred years or so had got used to this kind of thing. I mean, look at the furniture, um, uh, look at the, the details of the sculptures and things. Um, they're all kind of, um, they have a history to them and they're the relaxed in placement. Mm -hmm. And at this time, the monolith uh, by itself is the one thing that stands in contrast to this kind of complex language. And curiously enough, um, roughly the same time, um, some similar objects were made in the, uh, the Art of the Real exhibition in London. Uh, they appeared there in about 1969 or 70. Um, and this rectangular form, which is featureless, absolutely sort of perfect surface that uh, doesn't reflect light or def um, collect dust or it doesn't have fingerprints, it uh -oh. isn't anything like that. It's uh, just a pure form. Um, this is different from anything else you might see in the world. And it's the only thing that you can, um, you can use to represent that which is not of this world. Um, the, mm. the things that man make. Uh, this is the one thing they can't make, and it's it's relevant that when they tried to make one, it was so expensive that it failed, and uh, it was actually a really difficult thing to do. But the presence of the monolith throughout various scenes of the film is um, is like a, a reminder all the time of uh, the substance of the quotes that you come onto. I think. And yes. I, will, I will show some very simple drawings dating from the same period later on. Great. Okay, I just got one more slide. Um, you know, um, earlier I quoted uh, the forward to Bachelard, and now I think it's only fair to end this section of the talk with an uh, actual quote from Bachelard himself. And I think it does apply directly to uh, what, what architecture does for us, what a house does for us in a storm certainly what that room does in the context of the, of the narrative of 2001. Um, and here's a quote. So faced with the bestial hostility of the storm and the hurricane, the house's virtues of protection and resistance are transposed into human virtues. Such a house as this invites mankind to heroism of cosmic proportions. This also takes us back to David's brilliant comment about the, the cave and this room. It is an instrument with which to confront the cosmos and the metaphysical systems according to which man is, quote, cast into the world, unquote, might meditate concretely upon the house that is cast into the hurricane, defying the anger of heaven itself. Come what may, the house helps us to say, I will be an inhabitant of the world in spite of the world. Yeah. And that's the end of the my section. And here is, of course, we're doing this together anyway. This is an extraordinary thing that Chris sent me today. <laughs> Before I talk about this, I just want to say something about the bone that is thrown. Yes. At the earliest stage of bone mm -hmm. surgery, when they were um, fixing people's broken legs and things, they approached it because the only language they had was woodwork. So what they did was they cleaned off all the blood supply and muscle and uh, made a nice clean job, bolted it together and uh, sent the chap on his way. And uh, it was that kind of approach. And they were very surprised when the bone in question that had been repaired died fairly quickly. Bone is living tissue. And it's also piezoelectric tissue. So it's actually very sophisticated material uh, that has many properties. And at the time, uh, you, it would be conventional thinking to think of the bone as a primitive object, as a simple object, mm -hmm. um, and transitioning into a technological object. But in fact, um, bone itself is a very complex material. And uh, birds, for example, can breathe through their bones um, because they're so lightweight that they use uh, the hollowness of some of their bones in the wings to breathe through. And they have different breathing system to humans, which breathe in and out. 
and birds breathe uh, continuously, um, uh, which is why they can fly for thousands of miles. But anyway, I just wanted to say that. But I think that moment that you refer to um, in the film where he's discovering about the bone and throwing it into the air is like um, a moment when we say uh, the eyes are opening. Um, yes, the eyes are opened. Uh, the conceptual link is made and some eyes are opened. It's interesting how in this language, the English language, um, that has two meanings. Um, it's such a such a powerful um, simile to the eye, the eye actually opening, uh, that it's often used as a way of um, seeing the possibilities of something in a way that you don't quite know what they are, but you have a feeling that they're there. But what I want to do, if you can go back to the eye and, and play that again for a moment. Um, the eye blinks. Now, it shuts very slowly. Uh, sorry, it, it shuts quick and opens slowly. So it, it opens five times. Um, if you look at this happening. Okay, it lets information in, as it were, uh, gradually. There's a filtering process of uh, not being exposed to something, not being exposed to things, too much reality being exposed to once. But it's uh, when it blinks shut, it uh, does that very fast, um, to sh immediately shut off in, uh, the input of light at that moment. So I found that an interesting um, feature of how the eye works. But there are other things we can say about that, but I think we should move on. Um, you're going to see a lot of circles in the next bit. Uh, these are diagrams. This was the um, an encyclopedia drawn um, around about the same time that 2001 film was made. It was about uh, 1964, 65, these drawings were done. Um, because this was a period when photographs in books were a rare expense. And, uh, you know, unless you were doing something really special, um, uh, photographs weren't used at all. Illustrations, pencil drawings, pen drawings, etc., engravings, that, that was what was used. And this is from a book on astronomy uh, with lots of diagrams, hundreds of diagrams about how things work in a spherical space. Now, the obelisk, uh, it makes an interesting comparison to spherical space in that respect. And uh, if you go on to the next, um, you'll see that they were trying to give you a, an idea of what really goes on on the planet. And they use the process of exaggeration or car caricature to uh, explain what was really happening. So these, these are um, attempts around that time to explain what was really going on. Uh, the next one. Uh, this, when I, some years ago at uh, a place called Haystack Mountain School of Craft, which is up in Maine, in a remote area in Maine, which some people, uh, some of you have been to, um, we did a fascinating experiment because somebody asked a question, and this is the power of good questions. Um, somebody said, uh, can you see the horizon curve? And you can only see the sea. Um, so what we did, because there was a, a discussion, a uh, debate, whether you could see the curvature of the earth, uh, what height you had to be. So uh, we found the largest room on the campus and we drew the largest circle that we could, which was about 30 feet in diameter. And we then marked off um, uh, a, a minute of arc of, on that circle and traced uh, the segment of the curve that that represents that it's about um, uh, 20 feet or some 
if you think of yourself as the center and then you go out a certain radius and the, ang the aperture angle of the eye, say it's about 60 degrees, you can uh, work out how much of a line um, that represents in reality. So we did that to scale on a circle of 30 feet radius. Um, and we trace that bit of line off and then we put that on a blackboard and we drew next to it a straight line. And uh, we just asked everybody to look at the two samples and can you tell one is curved and can you tell the one is straight? And the answer was no, not really, couldn't tell. But however, if you get to um, a certain height of about 20 or 30 feet and uh, you're in an area of the earth where it's a particularly flat surface, then you would start to see the curvature a little bit. But you have to be, I think, in orbit to see the, uh, the circle prop properly. Uh, those two drawings, um, I really love this kind of drawing because um, they're not photographs of objects, they're explanations of concepts. So they're owned by people, by us. And the concept of where is the horizon uh, is explained in the top drawing. And the bottom drawing, the um, astronomical horizon, is one which takes us far out into space to the outer limits of the known space that we're in. And the apparent horizon on uh, planet Earth is the downward sloping angle that gives you a certain distance to what appears to you, what is in your world, what is in your reality. Um, so, okay, let's move on to one more. This is a, a solar phenomena that's seen in cold climates very often. Um, in fact, Michael, you and I were talking about this earlier, that I've only ever seen one of these. Uh, it's called a solar halo, and it's uh, composed of circles in the, in the sky around the sun, when I believe the um, water vapor is frozen. Is that the right? Do you think that's yes. correct? It's ice crystals, and then the sun is reflecting and refracting through them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, it's an amazing uh, thing that, in fact, nature itself can actually draw diagrams um, in the sky as well. It's like images of itself. Um, but th that's one thing that I think takes you away from uh, the way you think about things in, in everyday life. When you see something like this, it removes you temporarily make you think about something different. Can I just uh, make a comment about this? Um, it's true that you might not see the actual curvature in, in until you're at a high altitude. But one thing that I have I, I've re noticed repeatedly, um, and I saw it most recently a few weeks, two weeks ago in Puerto Rico, is that you, know, you can be at sea level, sitting on a beach, and you're looking, if it's a very clear day, you look at the horizon, and if you have good eyesight or binoculars or just good eyesight, you there is this line uh, between the earth, I mean, between mm. the water and the sky. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that it's ever shifting because it's wave. Those are waves. That is the terminator, not the terminator. That's the limb of the earth. Um, so you're actually seeing the limb of the earth. Um, if it was a flat planet, you wouldn't see that. You know, uh, it would just continue on ever. Mm, forever yeah. and then you might see another coastline but so you don't see the curve but you do see the edge the fact that you see an edge indicates that that you know it's a finite object and yeah, it's yeah. of a certain shape it doesn't necessarily tell you that it's a sphere but it does yeah, does yeah. tell you it could be a cylinder <laughs> you know yeah, exactly. but but it's the edge right yeah that's that's exactly where we got to when we did the exercise at Haystack. Um, there was a, a continuing debate about what we could see. Um, so Should we go to the um, next? Yeah, next. Uh, the kind of thing that that book, the Lewis Encyclopedia, was um, trying to convey to people in the simplest possible terms was all the basic information about the Earth in this case. Um, 
uh, they were showing you through by means of this drawing, which is in itself um, a square form. It could be a rectangular form, but it is basically a three axis rectangular. And you instantly understand what it means. I mean, I can look at that and see that what the proportion is between the land and the sea. Whereas if you say, you know, there are X thousand uh, tons of this and uh, X thousand tons of that, it, you don't really know what that means. Um, well, I think if you're a visual thinker, you can certainly see this instantaneously, but it's so modest and simple as a, as a technique. Although it's also, uh, I would say, it's only about surface area. Um, if you actually had land versus sea, um, I mean, the, the cube gives you the sense that it's about volume rather than surface area. Um, yeah. If it was land versus sea, and we were talking about the full girth, or the full, the amount of mass of the earth, the amount of rock and molten yeah. core and so forth, then the sea would be rather tiny little tiny. grain of salt, I think, yeah. next to a cube. Well, I think this is this illustration relates to uh, the familiarity of the time, mm -hmm. which is an ephemeral thing, as what you call representations of ephemeral uh, qualities. That um, if you draw uh, shapes of countries, uh, you only ignore the three dimensional issues of the uh, plates, the rock plates that it sits on, and the uh, the core of the earth, and so on. And you draw the, the um, shape of the seas, and then they simply the, the volume was drawn from that. But the point is that it's it's taking the data or the information available at the time with the way it was represented. So the point you're making about the, all the other things we've learned since, and all the the kind of the water that's in the rock and the water, mm -hmm. some rocks are, uh, you know, have no water in at all. Tectonic plates on plates and so on. Uh, a lot of that wasn't really known at this time. I, I think the detail of that uh, uh, can be now represented in a much more complicated way. But they, these yeah. are the things that we want to get into. Um, I think, can we go to the next one? Is there one more? Yeah. This one you'll be very familiar with if you were here yesterday, but we were showing uh, this is a model of, um, it's basically a drawing of a sphere tilted at the angle of the earth. And it gives the apparent motion of the sun around the planet. But in actual fact, um, if you look at the way uh, the human vision functions, then it's exactly the same in that the, the brain can uh, construct um, in a moving diagram, an inclined plane through a color sphere, which has, around the equator has all the different colors. And that the North Pole is white and the, the South Pole is black. And so any known color could be represented on that sphere. But the, uh, the introduction of the inclined plane is what the human vision system, including the visual cortex, actually does in order to establish sight. And it's one of the most remarkable convenient, uh, uh, sort of coincidences to me that uh, this is basically an armillary sphere. It's, um, it, you know, it's a model of the planet rotating around the sun and plotting the movement. So the environment is the thing that determines um, how the perceptual system uh, functions. Hmm, incredible. Um, I'm gonna stop the share. So we should pop back onto the screen now. Um, Andreas has vanished. Andreas, come back. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, there's a lot to speak about in, in, in Chris, in what you just said. I mean, um, I find it fascinating that you're comparing, uh, if, I understood, if I understood you right, the shape of the planet is similar enough to our perceptual apparatus 
yeah, our yeah. eyes that you're making a connection between, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, because you would expect uh, the features of the environment that you're in. If you're going to evolve uh, a meaningful sensing apparatus, that it's going to follow exactly the same patterns that you experience. And so uh, in order to establish what they call color constancy, you get um, maximum color contrast in lots of different lighting. Think about the ambient lighting of the room you're in, whether it's at a blue tone or gray tone, or uh, whether it's low lights, whether it's the different kinds of light every day of the year. That Um, it's what puts in context. It's the carrier the focus, wave, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like the carrier wave. Yeah, and the same thing happens with sound. Um, you, your brain is working. Uh, that's why listening to noisy environments to people talking is very tiring. Mm -hmm. Because um, your, your brain is working to filter out the noises it thinks it doesn't want until something pops through that it, it suddenly thinks you do want. Um, but that is a work, you know, that work is going on all the time. If you record, if you just put a tape recorder in that uh, space, um, it's impossible to work out what's going on. You can't yeah. tell. Um, it's just a lot of noise. But when you're listening with your ears, you can, it's, um, you're telling <laughs> uh, the part of it the part of the sound spectrum that is coming at you, you're filtering out the bit you want all the time as an active process. Right. Hey, Andreas, I, I kind of cut you off earlier and you, you, you know, and I feel bad about that. And I, I just wanted to finish my section of the PowerPoint or whatever. What were you asking about? What were you saying? Sure. I don't know if you can hear me, but I barely hear you guys. I think that my end. Oh, um, I was just asking what you asked earlier. I can't hear you. Uh, it's cutting out every other word. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. It comes and goes. I think I'll jump in when I can actually hear you guys because uh, it's it's been really, I'm, I'm struggling here. It keeps kicking me off and it's back and on again. Just keep talking. Okay. I'll, it's better. Andreas is you. in Greece and uh, after, after uh, fleeing with his family from the fires uh, of, further north and has bad connectivity. And there's I, I want to try to, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. No, look, I, 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 I'm bubbling with thoughts and uh, I, I want to try to do something. I don't even know if I can do it. So I'm going to just go for it. But the eye, what, just now we were at the, uh, that question of the, the, you know, Michael asked the curve of the eye and the curve of the earth that Chris was pointing out. And if I back up to the, blink, the, the blinking eye that, that Chris showed earlier, that, that the animation. And, you know, I think, I mean, Chris and I have had long discussions about blinking and, and winking, right? You know, the, the, and, and the, the transition or transformation of the blink to the wink. Which, you know, meaning we blink because the atmosphere, you know, it's an atmospheric response. It's a, uh, as, as uh, uh, Andreas pointed out many times yesterday, that like you can't just act, it's always an interaction, right? So, so there's an interaction, you know, it could be dust or wind or something, and, you know, we blink. Now, over a long amount of time, uh, that became, you know, a wink, right? So meaning the embodied response to our atmosphere became a form of language, a form of communication, I should say. Uh, and it's the same thing, but it's different, 
right? It's like the mark that is a mark, but is more than itself, right? It's, you know, it's carbon mm -hmm. and it's a bear. Yeah. And it's blinking and it's winking. And, the, and what, what fascinates me about this, and this is the hard part, this is a, the bridge I'm not sure I can build, is that clearly, you know, the of and the is, right? That, uh, you know, a drawing can be of something that always is something. We blink all the time. <laughs> And then yeah. sometimes we wink, meaning sometimes it's, it's communication. And, and the difference is so subtle. It's just like drawing, right? It's like a mark. But then sometimes that mark starts to become a bear in a cave, you know? And, and we start winking at each other. And it's both of them are relational to atmosphere, meaning some, the atmospherics of air and dust or the atmospherics of I don't know, desire. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I want to add something in here that um, is, is crucial to uh, what the, the film is about, the, the presence of the obelisk as being a marker for the one thing that is um, kind of uh, a difference to the world that we build. Um, the, you're not gonna you're never gonna find that i mean i know there are such things as little cubes in nature and crystal formations and so on but um that uh, the objects of the house but usually being a four square kind of structure um is a, a particular relevance to that as a kind of uh, bulwark against the world you don't that you know the reality that too much of you can't stand um, so, but what I wanted to say was that uh, vision can be both positive and negative in the sense that you can see things, you can see further ahead when your eyes are open. You know, I'm speaking metaphorically, when you opened your eyes to something, it means something has penetrated you, uh, you realize something. Uh, when you're, uh, there are different kinds of tears so that the tear film is a quite a complex three-layered uh, laminated uh, fluid structure because the cornea is a transparent material, which is very unusual in the body. It's a living material. It has to have a blood supply, um, and what, uh, but it doesn't have blood vessels. So that the tear film provides the nutrients for the cornea. And the cornea is made of obelisk shaped uh, solid blocks which are zippered together. <laughs> well, that's mind blowing. Um, Chris, I remember we had a, an interesting conversation actually many years ago now about that room, about the room at the end of 2001. And, 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 and the conversation went something like this. You pointed out that actually a hotel room is already a simulation, a representation mm -hmm. of home. You know, mm -hmm. it is imitating home, you know. Um, uh, I mean, we could, go into, we could go into the weeds here and say that a home is imitating a home. But, uh, you know, home is where you hang your hat. Uh, yeah. if, you're, if you're traveling, you hang it in a hotel room. 2001's hotel room is a kind of a simulation of a simulation of a simulation of a simul uh, you know, of home. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like uh, Magritte, this is not a pipe. Uh, or, you know, David, as you said, you know, it's a mark and yet it's a thing. Okay, so it's a mark and it's a thing. Um, it's not a pipe, but it looks like a pipe. It's not a, it's not a hotel room, mm. but it looks like a hotel room. Well, because Tony Masters said, let's do that kind of hotel room, but it's, it's referencing a hotel room. Um, the hotel room is referencing home safety. You know, that's what they provided this astronaut, the, they, whoever they are. Um, you know, and then it gets it gets even more complicated uh, than that. Um, uh, you know, um, I yeah, actually the the, yeah. um, the room itself uh, is um, it, it's made of uh, fairly low cost materials made to look like other materials. So that's another dimension of uh, oh, right. And, yeah. uh, whereas the original might be. Um, stone and uh, metal and other, you know, other details. This is made of uh, inexpensive softwood nailed together and uh, using filler and made to 
uh, you know, made to look like as posh as it can get. Um, it's a set, yeah. You're saying yeah. it's a set, right? Yeah, exactly. It's built like a set, and it's in fact a lot of, well, most of re what we call reality now is a set. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's built as a set. Uh, we are players, you know, yeah. you know, Shakespeare, we are players in it. Um, yeah. All the world is a stage and we are players in it. Well, yeah. so, so let me just say, you, you, you guys just built the bridge that I was wrestling with. And the bridge is that between the blink and the wing, meaning between the body that blinks in response to its environment, its atmosphere, and then the body that winks in response to its atmosphere. That other atmosphere may be language, it may be communication, right? But, but both of them, the blink and the wink, are both forms of shelter. They're both forms of creating an, a, a spatial response to our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. The physical blink and the communicative wink. And I believe, and you both just articulately expressed it, that fundamentally architecture emerged from that, from the mingle of the mm -hmm. blink and the wing. Meaning it fundamentally, you know, yet, you know, look, you know, you know, people always talk about architecture, the, 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 they talk about the shelter as like shelter from the rain or shelter from the cold and all that stuff. You know, that's maybe part of it. You know, we, but I don't believe it was enough to, to give birth to architecture. Mm -hmm. I don't, meaning we were fine in the rain for millions of years. It was no problem. You know what I mean? We, it, relates to, uh, it relates to what you say about opacity, that you have to have something to push against. And uh, exactly. when you create an interior, a home space, you need a lot more um, subtle things to push against to create your own psychology because you help to build things um, which in turn help to build you. This, and, is, uh, this is exactly the point. It's a fundamental question of architecture. It's footings, the structure of the discipline. It, and I would argue even its origin. And I mean, whether we want to say 100,000 years or 2 million years, whatever. You know, we, yes, we have to keep the rain out now. We have laptops to protect. We, we have to, you know, uh, wear clothing and, and all the thermal dynamics. I get it. It's not where it started. It started between the wink and the blink. It started in this, you know, elemental understanding of inhabiting the double, inhabiting the fact that it is something and it is more than itself. Otherwise, you don't get to the obelisk. You don't get to the you don't get to the mingling of language and the structures and substance of space. You know, the, the architecture wouldn't have been born if it was just to keep us out of the rain. Like I said, that was not the fundamental problem. It ultimately, I believe, and this is a longer thing, I believe it had to do with the earliest hints of taboo, you know, of like yeah. we don't go there, like it's over there. Whatever taboo was two oh, million years ago, yeah, there's, an, and there's an us and them, there's an inside and an outside interiority, the doubling of our yeah. interiority. Yeah. Is yeah, Andreas taboo. and I had a conversation about um, thing, uh, the aspects of the human body that uh, you, don't, you feel allowed and comfortable as seeing as the outside of, of somebody. And the bits where, you know, if you expose too much of it through uh, whatever reason, you, f you start to feel that you shouldn't be seeing that kind of thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a different life. There are different lives within you. Uh, you know, we know that the um, uh, biome inside uh, is 20 or 30% or whatever it is, is a massive amount of the human body and they have their separate evolution. <laughs> they have a separate evolutionary history. Um, the other thing about vision, just one thing I wanted to say, I forgot to add in, was that uh, this thing about controlling how much affects you and how much doesn't is a feature of human vision. 
that um, the tear film, which is made up of uh, three layers, one of them, uh, that there are glands in the eyes that when necessary, when you have um, tears of grief, for example, that they are um, fed with a hormone that um, is like an antidepressant and that's in your eye film. And uh, Andreas was explaining how that gets evaporated off your cheeks and it, it kind of shuts you down to a certain extent. So this thing about controlling what uh, you're exposed to, what is out there and what, mm -hmm. um, what you can deal with and what you can't deal with, you can't deal with everything. So you, you can only deal with um, a certain portion of it and our senses have evolved um, thus far to deal with that portion. Right, but, right. It's about controlling the portion you deal with and choosing when you want to deal with it. Yeah, so you're yeah. sheltering yourself and you have a window and a door. I mean, you know, you're, yeah, yeah. But, you know, um, one thing that occurred to me just in the last couple of days, um, and I think it links to all this, is that, you know, you look at the Old Testament. I mean, why did we settle down and build structures? Because prior to a certain period, David, you said, you know, okay, rain was fine. Well, people were moving around the planet. You know, you go to Mongolia, you see people moving still. Um, but there aren't many places on earth, on earth to still see that except for refugee flows, which are rising and will continue to rise, unfortunately. And that's what the point I'm trying to get at. Um, it occurred to me, you know, you look at the Old Testament, you had fires, you had floods, you had uh, the ne necessity of building the ark because of the flood. We believe that is probably when the Mediterranean busted through and created the Black Sea. That was the epic flood. You know, you had locusts, you had plagues. And, and a lot of civilization was built to counter these impacts on us of nature and, and, and uh, you know, ways, it's technology, early technology to try to control nature and have, you know, just like Bachelard was writing. So where are we today after centuries and centuries and millennia of development? We are now entering a period when once again, I believe, you know, you see it all around us. Andreas is not where he should be because of it. You know, um, we're entering a new period of plague and locusts and fires and floods. Um, so the question is, is that going to um, uh, create a new, you know, a new phase of evolution? Are we going to find a next step before, you know, to radically simplify, we built structures and we tried to control nature. We settled down, right? That's very simplifying things radically. So, you know. That whole 20th century sense, setting aside the World War, Second World War and the First World War, that sense that, you know, the sense that most of us in our generation had of safety, security, transportation, air conditioning, heating, you know, um, we're <laughs> secure here, you know, we're pretty secure here on Earth, we control the Earth actually, let's go to the moon, you know. All of that is kind of, uh, we're seeing clear signs this is breaking down because of our own impact. Mm -hmm. So what's the next step going to be? You know, are we going to find a way to deal with it? I, I, I have to say two things. One, I, I'm sure you know that the name of this exhibition is Sunship, the Ark that Makes the Flood Possible. Uh, yeah. And, and, and it's literally, I mean, exactly wrestling with the question you just asked, Michael. Like the point you brought up, this is what we're trying to do here. We're saying, you know, and, and I wrote a short 100 word text for the BNL. What if the arc was an arc in time? Arc is in a curve that slows time. Because if the arc was a curve that slows time, the flood would not be a destructive event. It would be a place like the ocean that mm. from which life emerges. And so fundamentally, the idea that our like, that, that that room in 2001, that that baby we see at the end, that this is it, like we need to broaden our spectrum of experiences so that we can uh, enter into the temporality that is the art that slows time that, and that gets us to the next world. Um, 
and the other thing is I want to say, and it, it, it's it's a little bit crude, but I, I I wanted to bring it up yesterday when Andreas was sharing the brilliant things about the nose and and his daughter and uh, and the diapers, um, and something that you know Michael just said about um, you know the early gatherings like. You know what brought us together you know and 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 i'm talking about like early civilization and this idea that you know okay we got the earth under control <laughs> you know all of that it's a total complete fiction i mean you know it's a complete theater really it's a theatricality um anyway but i want to recommend to everybody it's 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 it's, it's super important uh book uh it was uh, it's, and it's called the history of shit and, and it was written by a really brilliant young man. Uh, his name was Dominique Laporte. He was a, a student of Michel Foucault. Uh, he did his PhD with Michel Foucault and sadly died at the age of 35. But, um, but his, you know, he did his PhD and then he published a book and then he died. And the book is a remarkable, it's, an, it's a study of this. It's literally a study of hu the human body and what happened over 30,000 years with regard to repulsion, shit, and consumption. And I, 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 obviously it's a super important book for a reason and it gets into language and all these things. So I'm not gonna sum it up now, but I'm gonna give you three key sentences. Uh, we, <laughs> I can't read that, it's too blurry, but, I'll put it in chat and, and I'll, I'll read, I will read out loud some of your comments in chat, Andreas, okay. because they're very interesting. But uh, put it in chat and then we'll read it. But, but um, David, what were you, I, uh, you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, let me, let me just say, um, <laughs> you know, we have this picture in our head of the early formation of gathering, you know, like, over 50,000 years, you know, people started gathering together, hunter-gatherer movement, you know, all, all of that, nomadic and all of that. What Dominique Laporte sort of worked on was the gathering of consumption actually functioned in a distributed manner, meaning people could go, whether they were hunters or gatherers, could bring food. And even if they were farming, you know, the early agriculture, he was looking at the last 50,000 years. But as it got denser, as there were more people, whether it's 500 or 5,000, and then you get to 20,000, you know, you get to these dense gatherings that started happening a long time ago. The shit became the problem. Yeah. And what he analyzes is that the earliest formation of collective judgment of collective decision of the earliest forms of, of governance, the earliest forms of economic, like social, of, of structured finance, right? The earliest forms of those were, how do we build a system or structure to remove the shit? The shit, because it was, <laughs> it was dangerous to life, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. what's so beautiful is he links the fact that it's like an entropy model. Right? It's like literally a kind of physics model that what comes in was distributed, a distributed uh, communication system of resource. But the, the, what goes out, and it may be linked to the wink and the blink, the speed that, that Chris was saying, the, the, the closing and the opening, that what goes out required collective resources. And so early infrastructure, the earliest infrastructure, was about removal. And, and ultimately what he does is he links it to repulsion, to re repelling in language as part of the beginning of say, the Kora, the beginning of the Greek theater, the beginning of pushing out, cl clearing, the clearing in the woods, Nietzsche and Heidegger and everybody else. The clearing was a form of repelling from, uh, as a descendant of this kind of ancient thing of, pushing away as what gathers us together. Hmm. 
Anyway, yeah, so dialectical. I mean, it, it's, it's pure dialectics, you know. I mean, that's like Walter Benjamin's incredible statement: "There is no artifact of human civilization that is not also an artifact of barbarism." <laughs> right? Exactly. You, know, you can't have the one without the other. The right? bone. The bone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah the that's... Ball, and the bone, and Kubrick's bone. I mean, both. I mean, the yeah, bone, both. you know, and Kubrick using the bone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thou shalt kill. I mean, um, yeah, the axe. I mean, his axe, Kubrick's axe was his camera, <laughs> of course. Exactly. Um, but let me read, uh, that is fantastic. Is it, was there a second part about the shit question? David? No, no I just, I, I, I don't have the link to um, the arc in time. But I, those were the two things I wanted to say is, is, is when, you know, this idea of, of uh, our transformation, because we know, I mean, you know, the fires, the flood, the, the, you know, the, the, the COVID, you know, the rupture we're living, we know all that. And we know that mingle that with AI, mingle that with the, the baby in 2001. Mm. And we get to, we get to the arc in time. We get to the, the, the you know, the, 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 the sun chip, the, the, the future. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I don't mean to like link that to the history of shit, but I just because of yesterday, when Andreas was really revealing, you know, the nose and we know we don't eat that and, you know, repulsion right. as something that creates us, you know, creates us as we create the world. I wanted to try to put those two together. And oh, sorry, wink, blink. Because the speed that Chris points out, like, boom, it's like, a, you know, it's 10 times quicker our eyes close than they open. And I think that's, it's not only linked, it's linked to the history of architecture. It's linked to the origin of architecture. Shelter from the storm, right? It's both physical, it's embodied, and it's linguistic. We, we only find shelter because of the communicative shelter of saying, we are not outside, right? We created a, another in, interiority that mm -hmm. we can inhabit. It's a linguistic interiority, mm -hmm. by far more, I would argue, than a thermal interiority, than, than, than you know, like thermal dynamics. Um, and I, I just feel like that, that the, the problem of repulsion, interiority, space, is somehow can help us with the, your room, like, well, not your room, you know what I mean? Like the room as the place of evolution, literally yeah. like the place of evolution. You know, you know it's interesting. Um, one thing I uncovered in researching my book when I, was, when I wrote the afterword, the, the postscript chapter of 2001 was, yeah, so what happened after they released 2001? And I, I found an interview archive on archive.com of, Clark being interviewed by a San Francisco radio station. And um, the, the journalist asked him about Hal and the duel between Hal and the astronaut. Yeah. And, and, and Clark said something like, um, he made the comment that that could very well be a Pyrrhic victory. You know, and I found that fascinating because, you know, you have that whole scene where he's floating in the in the brain room of how there is a there, you know, it's writ, it's lit in red. It's like a womb. It's like a place of birth. He's the, the astronaut is like a, a fetus in a way, but committing a murder of the mind that surrounds it. So will it be a Pyrrhic victory? You know, we don't know that the answer is unclear now to us will the a will are we so we are the intermediate stage between ape and something else what will that something else be will it be ai will it be our creation that that exceeds us i mean that's a that's a whole science fiction trope for a very long time um but this, it's, it, last thing and then i really want to ask people to to yeah. I see there's a ton of uh, chats and i please do not be shy speak up um, I, but I, I want to say one thing, and I think this was touched on yesterday as well. It w is not, it, it, like what it will be is not up to it. It's up to us. It's up to what like our imagination's capacity is. Like our, the, the capacity of our imagination, our perception, 
our experiences, broadening our experiences so that our perception can be broadened and consequently understand the transformation. Like our capacity to understand transformation is the biggest question of our time. There's no, you know, you know, global warming and nuclear holocaust and massive famine, all of them fall under our capacity to comprehend transformation. So literally we can make the future what we can imagine it to be. And the work now, it is, is for me, it is pragmatically about the poetic imagination. It, it is about creating the room at the end of the film, like that moment when they were all wrestling with what the room should be. We mm -hmm. have to do that with what the world should be. <laughs> because if we do, we'll get, you know, the world will be, we won't be here, but people, others will, and it will be what we imagine is possible. Isn't that um, crazy? I just want to add something to that, David, that um, there's something, uh, there's many, many multiple aspects or facets of how nature works that we take for granted or are completely blind to. And uh, when we start researching or finding out how a part of nature works, it, uh, it takes us on to other aspects or surprising dimensions or things that are paradoxical uh, to us. Um, but uh, whether they are or not, this is something Andreas and I have spoken about, that we have different views. And Andreas will say that uh, paradox powers nature. And when I come at it from the point of view of language, I would say that the, there's no such thing as a paradox because the word paradox simply describes an experience that we have. Therefore, we can't know what nature will do or is capable of. And I think a study of nature is um, central to anything that happens, uh, you know, anything in the future. Now, other people might disagree with me, but uh, I think it, the technology that Andreas has worked with is coming closer and closer to understanding how a natural system works. Um, and But there are many of those. There are many natural systems that we don't know about and some that we do know about. Uh, it's a huge area of research. Yeah, also, I think we have to, even though, you know, we're overburdening this world with too many of us, we are part of nature. You know, it's like we were what we were saying yesterday, you know, that there's no such thing as just being separate from it. And, you know, there's this Heisenberg principle, you know, you observe something, it changes, you change it, it will change you. There's no such thing as being separate. You know, we are part of it. So, you know, um, and, you know, it has been argued that we are how the universe regards, regards itself, but I think mm -hmm. there's lots more, lots of evidence that all of life, and certainly a lot of, you know, life with higher brain functions, you know, dolphins, whales, um, et, et cetera, mm -hmm. perceive the universe as well. So life is a way in which the universe perceives itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. I want to ask people if they would please uh, share thoughts and comments and questions and whatever else that they would like to share. And please don't be shy. Just jump right in. Don't 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 hesitate. Actually, David. Um. Um. Hey, David. Here. This is um. I, oh. Hey, David. Hey, how are you? Hey, Chris, going? how are you? Hi. Um, so, Hi. yeah, I, well, yeah. Hi there, long time no see. So, um, yeah, really enjoyed, you know, both days uh, lecture. And um, there were some ideas that I've been thinking from yesterday, but I think something got really clearer today, um, looking at all the slides there is, um, is because I think uh, someone yesterday talked about the character and, you know, and we talk about a lot of things that we discover, you know, our senses, how we don't understand ourselves, how ourselves function, you know, you know, our smells and vision and stuff. I just, there's just a one thought about things that I, I just realized is I feel um, the, the paradox of how much we will be able to know ourselves. And I, you know, and how, um, sorry, I'm, I'm still rephrasing this thing, but I feel like we just talk about, you know, um, we from, you know, the very, like, as 
um, just, you know, as, as we evolve as a human species, I just feel like there's one thing that, um, that seems to be like an outstanding feature of human being is not being smart, but like being the very rigid character and very, um, it's, it's rigid. It's not smart or smooth as a bird or, you know, an animal because animals are smooth. They, they never evolve into the way we do on the drawing and do marks because the marks are very, we, you know, we say in a way kind of, I don't know, primitive is the right word to use, but you know what I mean? Like the character, you know, you draw those lines, this, those uh, distinct lines are, are very rigid and like building architecture as well, you know, how we, you know, stack up this structure because animals do structure as well, but they do it really smoothly. It doesn't distinct from nature, it's part of nature, but we somehow mm -hmm. did it in a dumb way <laughs> that it becomes very distinct from nature. And I, mm -hmm. I, as we talk about that, I just feel like that seems to be like a feature of our species. It's just not smart enough, just <laughs> doing, doing those things. <laughs> but but it kind of is what we are because um there's one slide chris showed where the um the earth rotate i recently sorry this is right i recently watched a because i listen to podcast sometimes on asian astrology and there's recently there's this this person um he because there's a thing called house system and ancient you know uh, mathematicians they calculate you know the the angle of the earth and also the perception thing so one of the house system is they divide the earth from the angle of a human being like when you imagine the earth and you know like and there's so many things we invented we thought are scientific are so evolved around us it's kind of also has that character character that is when you really look at it from a history like i don't know 10,000 like i don't know like 100 years later it's like oh my god that's really primitive that's just a very you know a, a few lines draw there and it's like not a very but I don't know like I just got this thought I just feel like maybe that's where we're you know and I thought about artificial intelligence I think you know maybe I just feel like you know I'm not like I actually used to study artificial intelligence before I transferred to architecture just like one year but I just um I I think it's a great thing but I just feel you know I just the more we talk about these issues I just realized you know it's it's the dumb like the character character of us that define us as who we are otherwise i just feel like you know we would never have evolved like the way we do we would just stay in nature and just be really smooth with it and just you know be there and just that's it. but we, we somehow wasn't smart enough i feel like we evolved the other way we just never you know synced with nature and just like desynced uh, somehow but i don't know that was just a random thought sorry yeah just uh, one of the things right. Andreas said in the quote was that um, just like an apple tree is appley, um, producing apples, the earth is peopley, the earth is producing people. Yeah. And um, it may be that we're just in a transitional stage where the brain, as complex as it, as it is, needs so much to learn. Um, it's kind of a last gasp. It's, it's almost as though the population is being expanded so rapidly because all the brain power is needed. Um, uh, that, that's, uh, that the future lies in the direction of our evolution. Oh, it's interesting. I mean, um, I'm not sure I agree entirely. I mean, there's, a, of course, there's a lot of crude, rude, structures out there there's a lot of crude and rude and ugly i mean in north america north america is jammed to the gills with you know um, architecture that i can imagine the greeks and the romans looking at and saying what were they thinking what this is the future you know um, <laughs> yeah. but on the other hand there are other structures uh yep. in major cities where they might they would be staggered and humbled and amazed and so forth so you always have that dialectic. I mean, there's always, yeah. I think the Acropolis, for example, or Greek temples, you know, like you see in, in Sicily, you know, are, are absolute manifestations of higher brain function. You know, they're not, they're not yeah. what, you're, what you were saying, if I may say. Um, you know, another thought that occurred to me, you know, when we were talking about caves, you know, and how the cave paintings were actually, or I said, you know, the cave paintings are actually the end result of many, many prior years. We look at it and we say, that's the beginning. Well, mm -hmm. it was actually the end of a long process. I remember reading about um, 
you know, uh, Utsi, the, the guy they found in the Alps, the um, Bronze Age um, mummy that they found in the Alps, you know, had a bag with him and it had the technologies of the time, including arrows. And they analyzed those arrows. And those arrows, which were, of course, his source of survival, you know, were made of some extraordinary number of different kinds of wood. And some of the wood came from North Africa. Mm -hmm. And it, that was the technology of the time. And, and I'm sure that they were beautiful. Uh, if you saw one newly made, you would think that is beautiful and lethal, you know, a piece of design. It's from understanding the world and, and mm -hmm. building something, you know. Um, and we, of course, tend to look in the way, you know, arrogant way that we who are alive now look at the rest of history and go, well, they were primitive then. Well, we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that now. We couldn't build such technologies now. So um, anyway, that's just my uh, perhaps yeah. not, not very yeah. coherent response. To <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I feel like I'm not, yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to say everything is like, you know, but I just feel somehow we instantly have that. I don't know if it's like a specious gut feeling. We just tend to, we, we're kind of analog, but we're not that analog. We're like, half analog but not too it's like we're you know i don't know if analog is the right word to use but it's like digital analog like you know we, we have that, that like we're like computer do things think in terms of one and zero that's that's their like unit of thinking we're like and there's like this also out there there's this phenomenon that is like you know just totally curves and stuff we're just somewhere in in between and i feel like that seems to be our stand there like when we try to be really like very smooth we just fail to be like not i don't know it it just maybe I, I just feel like the thing we create like especially i think architecture is one of the most um um signature thing we create as a human being it's just you know it's like of course like modern contemporary ones try to create smooth ones and stuff but you know i i, I don't know it just it I, I don't know how to explain that, but I think maybe that's why architecture is the 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 most I don't know I wouldn't say most Asian one of the most Asian art form because there's something very very um, instinct that comes from human being that is embedded in there that is relevant to what David was saying also the shelter you know um, talk about the that interiority of of the mind not just the 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 the, the thermal or like the the physical shelter but I I don't know like that which is, I, was well, thinking about I heard recently um, an interesting phrase that humans um, were essentially an encrusting species. In other words, uh, they built these uh, permanent structures around themselves that could last for hundreds of years. And uh, they were built of, you know, concrete and uh, materials that lasted uh, like um, coral reefs and so on. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to say that obviously it, it's interesting in America, which um, a lot of people have, have come there from Europe, uh, they've created in their architecture, in their structures, a kind of memory, a theatrical memory of uh, the architecture of their homeland. So there is a, a kind of reproduction again, just there, just in the transition around the world. Um, as though there's something about the patterning or the uh, the visual language of the structures that uh, is very important to them, even if it's made of um, very low cost materials, it still it still carries that importance because of its yeah. shapes and designs. Yeah, got it. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, sometimes, and I don't know if this directly responds to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think of the uh, the Sesame Street principle, <laughs> <laughs> you know, where there's they used to sing that song, you know, which one doesn't fit in with the others, you know, and um, yes. and I I can't help but wonder. I mean, to me, it's a mystery. I don't have anything smart to say about this, but I find it mysterious how different we are from all of the other species, right. uh, you know, we don't fit in with the others. And, and 
you know, I don't even, I don't want to speculate. I don't know what that means, but I, I don't think we can ignore it. I think that our relationship, you know, between the wink and the blink, <laughs> between, you know, uh, representation and language and architecture and all, all of these layers of consciousness that we map upon the world, you know, we, you know, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe foxes do look up and say, oh, there's a bear. I don't, you know, maybe they do, um, you know, but I know we do. And I know we say there's a tree and there's a house and I need a house. I want a bigger house, you know, like, but we clearly are dis different yeah. than everybody else here. And ultimately asking that question, you know, and I'm not, I'm not proposing the answer to that question. I'm saying, asking the question, like fessing up that like, holy shit, there's like, whatever number of hundreds of thousands of species on earth. And then we're, then there's us and you know, we have language and we have nuclear weapons. Mm. And somehow between the word the cave joint and the nuclear weapons, like what happened? Why are we different? If we don't, if we can't ask that, yeah. we're not gonna get there. Can I, can I say something about what Arthur Clarke would have said as a, <laughs> as a you know, uh, maybe in the 20, in the later 20th century, uh, when he wasn't quite as old, when he was still idealistic, um, uh, about that, what he hoped and what he stated in his writings, Clark is known for his science fiction, but he had an equally impressive body of nonfiction essays, you know. And, um, and he made the point, he thought that the, the jump into space by the human race was as important as when life moved from the sea to the land. And, and he had this beautiful line about from the sea of salt to the sea of stars. Mm. And he had this uh, idea that, that we are the instrument by which life will expand into the universe. And I, I happen to have a very um, warm feeling, a warm, a warm and positive feeling. I have been I was imprinted by him when I was a kid, that, that way of thinking by reading him and seeing 2001. But you know, we are going back in a way to 2001 with that, with that question, David, as obviously not an accident. You know, um, there's the rebirth of the species there. So, so that would be one way of answering your question about well, what, what is this about? Why are we this way? You know, um, we, we, we tend to want there to be a purpose you know, in the universe, mm -hmm. uh, a purpose of the universe and in ourselves in the universe. And um, um, that's, that, anyway, that's what he might answer is that we are the instrument by which um, life will expand out into the universe. Yeah. And we don't know if there's other life out there expanding in our direction, that would be nice, <laughs> maybe. Well, by the way, uh, I mean, William Burroughs, you know, yeah. another great writer of the 20th century, um, wrote a, a very short book. I mean, it maybe is 50 pages called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And in it, he talks about the frog, the water and the frog transitioning to land, like from, uh -huh. you know, having a frog had gills. They started, they, they, they couldn't breathe uh, outside of water. And then they evolved, they transformed into uh, going on to onto land a uh, very complex story about yeah. droughts and things um and but burroughs links this that to the same point that you're just saying that that we humans are you know searching for time and we might find space <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know by 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 going go, making the next leap from water yeah. to land to to outer space um, yeah all right, cool. Nice meeting. Like that was such a wonderful presentation. I'm gonna just sick out. Just I'm gonna. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andreas said something interesting that I want to read aloud because um, you know he can't speak. He's mute, which for Andreas is just an extraordinary thing. I mean, that's like it uh, must be uh, brutal. We did not <laughs> intend this. <laughs> um, but let me read it out loud in case anybody people haven't read the uh, chat. Um, he says, my comment on the room with the monolith in front of the bed was that it is reminiscent of a flat screen TV in front of many beds in many bedrooms today. Perhaps another unexpectedly poignant, poignant point is that just as the monolith program mandates, 
So does the TV in our bedrooms. TV programming is actually programming humans. The point I was trying to make about the flying bone becoming a spacecraft as perhaps the most infamous cut in the, you know, in, I would say famous, but infamous implies naked, but okay. Uh, in cinema history is that it is the quintessential eureka moment. The man ape is ecstatic because he has at that moment when invention happens, exactly. The human mind sees the whole thing at once and, it, and is exuberant. I speak from many such experiences, favorite sensation ever, the eureka moment, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then he said a few minutes later, my comment on the room, oh, that's the same. Um, okay, and then, then there's one that's um, equally relevant and important. Dogs can actually obtain calories from eating human poop. One idea is that this is the key to why they were useful to early humans and followed them around. Huh, interesting. Um, whereas cats, uh, were symbiotically, they were useful to us when we did settle down because, you know, we were storing grain in silos in Mesopotamia and the vermin came, vermin came, uh, rats and mice, and the cats were helping to control that. Um, and then Joel Cox wrote, I would speak, but people are sleeping all around me. I hope that's not because they're watching our presentation. I wonder what time zone he's in. When I last rewatched 2001, my reading of the film was that it was about how technolo technological progress is irresistible to humans for better or worse. That is so true. E.g., we are developing technology like AI, auto automation, weaponry, et cetera, that have terrifying risks to us as humans, but we never think that perhaps it would be better just to pause technological progress. In the film, we can't help but investigate the obelisk. We are drawn to it, despite it being intimidating and scary. Um, yeah. And then Andrea said, paradoxically, it's impossible to know what's impossible. Yes. Anyway, that, those are some of the interesting comments. Thank you so much, Michael. If anybody would like to respond, or if anybody would like to ask any questions, uh, who's there in the audience still? Zubin. Yes, we're, we're gonna call on you, Zubin. We see you're in the chat and you should just jump in the room. Just unmute, Zubin. <laughs> we got oh. you. Hey, uh, <laughs> uh, I know, Zubin. Hey. Um, yeah, I mean, I threw in the, the, the quote that's been bouncing around my head from, uh, 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 it's a book um, um, by Robert Polk Harrison. It's called Forest, the Shadow of Civilization. <clears throat> and he, he talks about, it's like a cultural history of forest. But he he, he talks about Vico and like Vico's sort of creative, kind of imaginative archaeology of human thought. And, um, you know, the kind of, at first there were the giants. And the first thing the giants did was make a clearing and the clearing was the locus and the clearing was the eye to see the sky. I was just thinking about like the eye, mm. the, the AI eye. <laughs> and then, you know, that kind of got wrapped into the Cyclops. Mm. But, you know, and again, like Vico, it's a Vico, it's an imaginative, an imaginative sort of um, like a, a creative archaeology of uh, the kind of origins of human consciousness and thought. But um, yeah, I, I'd never really thought about those things together. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and then and Vulcan, you know, this kind of tools, techne, the bone, um, kind of maintaining the, the clearing which you do through um, artifice and then the relationship to, I don't know, I, I just hadn't thought about that allegory in relation, you know, and Vico's is a, you know, it's particular, it's like 18th century and Vico's new science is very particular, but um, yeah, I don't know, that made me go home. That's really interesting. You know, um, one thing that we haven't gotten to in this conversation is that, you know, the monolith has its echo in uh, ancient 
prehistoric architecture, meaning yeah. you know Stonehenge mm -hmm. and other uh, paleo archaeological, paleo astronomical archaeological sites. And mm -hmm. in those paleo astronomical archaeological sites, there were there were attempts, successful attempts, I would say, frequently to create a kind of a static clockwork system uh, where the, you know, the motions of the sun, you know, you know that. I mean, we know this about Stonehenge, mm -hmm. but it was creating a way of seeing, you know, it was an eye, make, you said making a clearing and, and, and in that clearing, making an understanding, let's say, you know, creating an understanding, a mechanism by which we understand. I mean, mm -hmm. um, actual technology, techne, you know, Techne, technology, what we consider technology, all came from uh, attempts to replicate the, the cosmos, the motions of the cosmos, first in stone, and then you know with the Antikythera mechanism, in, you know, which was discovered in Greece in 1901, with gear wheels and so on, replicating the motions of the spheres, trying to understand how it worked by make, bringing it to Earth, right, and and recreating it. You know, you don't. Kubrick said to one of his people, you know, he, Kubrick would fix his people with this, this eye, those eyes of his and say, so what have you done? And what about that technique you were telling me about? How does it work? You know, and then I spoke to some of his young Turks who are now, you know, a little bit older. And, and they said, if you didn't know how to describe it, you better watch out. You know, you better know how to explain what's happening. And, and Kubrick said to one of these guys, I forget his name right now, if you can't explain it, then you then you don't know, you know if you can't explain it then you don't know how to do it you have to be able to explain it and so Stonehenge I would say and and then later attempts to replicate in orreries and um, gear wheels how the spheres turn and everything it was an attempt to build it so that so that we could understand it you know what I mean you know Michael it's what what moves me so deeply in that is thinking of of Kubrick's eyes, you know, when you said him. Yeah, okay. his eyes. <laughs> right, and I mean like us as the ancients, that, that, you know, seriously, look at, I mean, talking about a guy, you know, from the Bronx today, you, we know Kubrick, right? Yeah. But he, like his ferocity of intellect and and creative uh, intensity, you know, like present tense creative urgency is not unrelated to the archaics, whether we go back a thousand years or we go all the way back to the bone. That mm -hmm. same, th you see, this is what fascinates me. Film emerged in the solar system. <laughs> it's not like it was just like born in New Jersey with the Edisons. Mm -hmm. It was born in our solar system, this du duplication of film and story and the mingling of story and film and image and, and inhabitation and, you know, the, the zoetrope sun that Zoetrop. we live in. Uh, Zubin reminded me, we did a whole project called Zoetrope Sun about that, right? So this is the thing, like, we, when I said earlier, we are in the cave, I mean, partially, you know, it's like metaphoric and it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I, but there's a literalness to it, which is to say the will that we imagine was in the arm of the mark maker in the cave. Yeah. And the, and the will that Kubrick had to move the hand to touch the obelisk, which he effectively he did, right? He created a representation like the cave drawings where the hand touched the obelisk. Kubrick is this, has the same will. It's the same thing. It's a reduplication. And all of it is in some, in some ways mind boggling conversation with the solar system. You know, we're not separate. As you say, also, where do you think we are? Film yeah. is the cave drawings. Yeah. yeah. Now. Also, also, you know, the Antikythera mechanism, which if you read about it, you know, it was 
it was BC or directly, you know, it was at the turn of the, uh, you know, from BC to AD. Um, but I think it was BC, anticuclear mechanism. Um, you know, when they, they started studying this thing, it was pulled up with all these statues of glassware and stuff. It was a, it was a luxury, it was a cargo for a wealthy Roman coming from, from Rhodes, Rhodes. Uh, and in that, in all the gold and everything that glittered was this little set of gear wheels they pulled up and it, it took a long time. I learned about it from Arthur Clark, Antipathera Mechanism. He told me about it. Um, anyway, um, one of those, the, mo the, the largest gear wheel in there, uh, they figured out, um, was the one that could be used to measure the 17 year Saros cycle of eclipses that the Mesopotamians had worked out over centuries of observation using marks on, on clay tablets, you know, hard won knowledge over generations and generations. The Greeks inherited that. And then, and then some genius or group of geniuses worked out how to replicate it mechanically. You know, so you had all those teeth in a ring and, and that you could crank that analog computer every year, every month. I don't know exactly, we don't know how many times, but if you kept it going, there would be the 17 sorrow, 17 year sorrow cycle would be represented in an analog computer, right? So, so that's, that's the result. And, and, and then just to finish that thought. So I've made the argument that all contemporary technology comes from this attempt to replicate the, the motions of the spheres, but you can certainly say that film technology, which relies on these turning sprocket wheels, you know, they, you know, it did come from that logic. It came straight from that logic. Right, you know, absolutely. Gear wheels, stillness yeah. and motion, the ultimate question, right? Yeah. I mean, stillness I mean, from the, the 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 celestial, the the solar system, the solar system, stillness and motion, and yeah. it, 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 it so the will to reproduce it takes all forms. Yeah. It doesn't end at biology; it becomes. A, 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 a panoply, if that's a word, of forms, including the sprocket, including the film, including the still frames becoming motion picture and the zoetrope. It's all in different scales. And I, I believe it's all in some way um, linked, uh, linked to the solar system and informing us of the solar system. Yes. It reminds me of why I like riding a bicycle so much. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. By the way, you know, also about those Mesopotamian astronomer astrologers, you know, the longest continuous record of observations in science and in the history of science is not modern for modern science. Modern science is fairly short. It's, it's century after century. I think, I believe it was six centuries of continuous observation six centuries by the Mesopotamian astrologer, astronomer. And, and you know, the belief system in their work or, or their work was the result of a belief system that we view now with certain condescension, a lot of us, you know, oh, it's astrology. And of course, um, you know, some of it had to do with when do you plant and when do you harvest and when do you do that, you know, so there was always uh, information that was actionable intelligence necessary for succeeding as non-migratory people, right? Um, when to plant, when to harvest. Um, but the fact is that astronomy grew from something that we look at as astrology. You know, uh, remember the other day we were talking about uh, um, Newton spending half of his time doing, you know, working on alchemy. Well, we look at that with condescension now, but they didn't know. He didn't know if there was truth in there. You have to explore all these different options. And we have our own belief systems now. If we're, you know, in the future, 5,000 years, they'll look at it, um, you know, if, if we're still around uh, with a certain degree of uh, condescension, I think. Yeah. Well, That's some have true. said that the first verifiable uh, act of alchemy was Oppenheimer. <laughs> uh, yeah, <that's laughs> right, good. you know, he, where num number became, yeah, you know, this, you know, the, 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 
mathematical catastrophe allowed for atomic catastrophe. Yeah, right. And so it's a form of alchemy. And, and, and maybe, you know, we, we attribute different uh, cr uh, credibility to the, the so-called science behind uh, Oppenheimer and the physicists and the nuclear bomb, but- uh, And filmmaking is alchemy. Of course. Uh, well, as you said already, I mean, filmmaking is an alch alchemy. You're using chemicals, you're using, you know, to create that yeah. image. In conversation with what Chris was working on yesterday with the visual cortex. You know, I mean, any the great filmmakers like Kubrick and, and, a, and a few dozen others uh, knew, they understood that, that they were in conversation with uh, our visual cortex, with, with consciousness. Otherwise, I mean, the, con the content and the material of 2001 and Space Odyssey, both the light, the, I'm talking about the actual physical material of the film, and the story, the content, both of them are very clearly speaking to the transformation of our, our visual cortex in relation to our evolutionary condition. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, the, that's what I meant where Kubrick is a cave painter. <laughs> you know, he, 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 he embraced the, 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 re, the reenactment of our imagination. Yes. My God, guys, it's, I love this. It's so great to, to, to see you and to, to have this fun. And uh, poor Andreas, I think he's having serious problems with his uh, uh, Zoom or internet or whatever. Yeah. yeah, well, he's, you know, in this um, Greek uh, zone of, of, um, of, you know, problematic zone of crisis and, and uh, reduced communication ability and reduced electricity and all that mess um, that's going on in Greece. And that's, what, that's kind of what I was getting at and saying, we're entering this, I mean, we know this, we're entering this new period. Um, it just seems so clear. Uh, we're entering a new period in history when, uh, you know, it's, go it's going to, it, it's, it's looking increasingly like it's going to have some echoes of Old Testament uh, mm. floods and famine and, uh, and uh, tragedy. I mean, uh, we okay, can't, we can't I prefer, it. David, I agree with you that we have to do something about this, obviously, you know, we have the, the ability to do something about it, we just have to do it, I mean, yeah, just, just. Well, it's far beyond policy, it's really about uh, recognizing the transformation of our uh, comprehension, that's the pragmatic work here, I, I really mean that, it yeah. is, I, I'm all for reducing carbon emissions, you know, we cannot waste our time that's right. yeah, that's gonna gonna solve it. we gotta we gotta transform our perception of the entire situation or we have no hope you know it's yeah. much deeper than than that and and i actually try to work on having policy language <laughs> you know transform too i mean I'm, i haven't given up on the fact that this massive apparatus that we've built over the last thousand years uh can maybe be transformed but I think there's a there's a, a more hope in a deeper project of transforming uh, our consciousness relative to transformation itself, relative to uh, our our perception of what's happened, which is what Kubrick was working on. I mean, you know, those, the, that work is a, a much deeper project. I don't abandon the hard work of trying to change policy makers' understanding of language. Um, we have to do that. Uh, but I think the, the, the work we're doing here now with the Sunship is about changing our perception uh, uh, and comprehension of transformation itself. If we, can, if we can do that work, I think that to me, what we're doing right now is more pragmatic than all the lead certification in the world. You know, all, the, <laughs> yeah. all, all that architecture, leader. come on, let's do this and we'll maybe get there. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we should stop. I, I, great to see you, and I'm uh, thrilled uh, to uh, continue this tomorrow night. Okay.
Thank you. And I just wish Andreas uh, didn't have such uh, tech problems, but tomorrow let's hope that that's all solved. So, you know, yeah, we can we, mix it up. Right. Try and get in touch with them tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll find them and see what we can do. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe, maybe he's going to have to make the leap to ALN. So he has better Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Okay. <laughs> all right, folks. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you everybody for listening.